really pleased to be here because um, I'm the General Manager of the Institute of Information Security Professionals and it's great to have the opportunity to talk to you all about what we're doing. Um, my background is information security. I've been the general manager at the IISP for about the last three years, but prior to that I was in practice um, mainly at Marks & Spencer, heading up, well, setting up and heading up the function there. Uh, so my background is information security. What's new to me is actually running an institute and a membership management organisation, so I've had a career change in terms of doing that. What I really want to talk to you about today is uh, some changes that are happening within the space that we're working and really that's how it's affecting professionalism and the very much the need for a professional institute which we have. Right, okay, so a little bit about the IISP. We were formed at the end of 2005, really probably more 2006 before anything actually started happening. We're a not-for-profit organisation which uh, we're, we're also independent um, because that's where we want to be. We don't want to be aligned to any major organisation or company because we see ourselves trying to become something like the Institute of Chartered Survey Surveyors or Accountants or the BMA. And in fact, we're going to be going for chartered status at some point as well. Uh, we're governed by a non-elected, sorry, an, an elected <laughs> non-paid uh, non uh, board. Um, so they're largely made up from um, some fairly eminent people within the uh, information security industry and everybody's aim is to just get us on the map as a profession. We're funded purely by membership subscriptions, um, so we need the support of the industry to help us to do things. The more members we have, the more we can actually do to help develop the profession and to help you guys. We have a small secretariat which I head up and all of our programs are, are run by volunteers. So that's a little bit about our positioning. What we did when we set up the Institute was that we sort of said, why are we here? And the mission of the Institute is to become the professional body um, and to advance professionalism within the industry and to become the sort of focal point of the, um, for, for the profession. I think you probably all can see that there's so many organisations out there that have got I's and A's and S's and there's so many acronyms out there that it's, it's difficult to know which is what. And we're not trying to compete with them, but we're trying to provide an overarch really to, to all of the different organisations out there and all of the different functions that they provide. And we're also trying to act as a, an accreditation authority and um, we've made quite a lot of inroads into that area and I'll come back to that later. So those were the, the sort of laudable concepts that we had when we set up. Um, now, if you go back to 2005, 2006, the world was quite a different place then. Um, it's not that long ago, it's only six or seven years ago. But if you think of the uh, pro proliferation of initiatives that have been happening over the, the time since then, I mean, we didn't really have cloud in 2006. We didn't really have bring your own device. We had far more of a fortress mentality than we do now. But if I can just talk about some of the things that are happening within the industry and just highlight how we need to have professionalism because industries are just now reliant on their information security specialists to be able to protect them. So if we look at some of the things that are happening, um, firstly, there's a huge skills deficit. And this is not just me trying to bang on and drum up membership. This comes from the National Audit Office, is that there is a skills gap and it's not getting any better. Um, that uh, It says there it could take up to 20 years to address the security skills gap at all levels of education and that we're very dependent on a small number of people. So people that are already in the industry, the world's your oyster basically. I know there's some students here. It's a great profession to be involved in because it's probably one where there are more jobs than, than students and um, more roles and things that you can go into and certainly areas that you can develop into. So that's a big thing, it's a big skills de deficit. When I first started doing security, people tended to go on word of mouth, is that there was a huge amount of networking and if you wanted somebody that knew about something, it was sort of almost you'd, you'd go back to your network and try and find out 
who was the best person to, for the job for you. We, we're too big an industry to be able to do that now. We need to have controls and measures so that if you're going out in the same way as if you were going to a doctor, you'd want to know that you were seeing either a GP or a heart surgeon. Well, I would, anyway. I, I wouldn't take any chances. So there's a big skills deficit there. And if you look at the complexity of security as well, um, it's, it's got far, far more complex over the years. Uh, and that cannot be getting any simpler. Um, if you look at the business drivers and all of the things there, the complexity is, is immense. And it's not just a question of being a comms guy anymore and being able to configure a firewall and just being a policy person and making some rules up. And as we said, the complexity, I mean, that just gives you an idea of some of the things that are there. Globalization, cloud, virtualization, bring your own dev devices, the whole social um, networking thing. It's, it just gets more and more complicated and it's not going to get any easier. Um, and again, as it gets more complicated, the attack surface gets much wider. So it's much easier for the bad guys to, to attack us. And if they do attack us, the, the, the payloads are even greater. So it's raising the stakes, you know, what, all, all of the, the time. And the bar is getting higher, and the, 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 the music's getting faster. And um, it's, it's, it's getting ever, ever more complicated. So I don't want to keep sort of going on about how bad it is, because we all know that there's some challenges out there. But there's also some tools that can help us as well. If you look at big data and the, 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 the SIEM tools that are out there to, to help us to manage things. But we need to know, know how we can use them and um, make them sort of work for us. So there's all of these sort of things happening. And cloud has completely changed the whole game, basically, that small organizations are now able to take advantage of technology that would have cost hundreds of thousands or millions of pounds. So with cloud comes a lot of opportunities, but also comes a lot of risks, and we need to work out how we manage those as well. Um, and areas that we never really used to worry about, um, you'll suddenly start hearing people talking about SCADA, which is used to um, look at uh, putting controls into process systems. So things like oil rigs and um, manufacturing plants, oil refineries, those sort of things, they rely heavily on SCADA. Now, beforehand, those used to be sort of behind closed wall, closed doors or behind walls. But now they're even, related, even interconnected over the internet. Um, and that brings a whole new area that we need to look at how we control. So it's it's getting complicated and also the people that we have that are working in the industry. Um, there's a lot of talk about the changing role of the CIFA, CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer. Um, it used to be that it was a sort of governancey type job, you know, you'd put some rules in, depending on what industry you were in, uh, would depend on how many rules there were. The, the financial services industry has always been very, very heavily regulated, but you're seeing that changing dramatically because legislation is becoming incre increasingly pervasive and with globalization it's becoming e increasingly complicated because you're having to work across multiple jurisdictions. Um, it used to be that the, the, the CISO was the person that set the policies um, and it's moving towards the, t the, 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 the point now where the CISO is actually advising the board about how technology and how security can help their business or how it can help their business to fail. And we're seeing more and more people now at the CISO level that are communicators rather than being technical. But then we're also seeing a, 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 an increase in people that are deep down technical, technical. So where is it going? Is it going that you've got somebody that is a business person or is it somebody that's a sort of data fork commander and the jury's out on that but really the story that we're trying to tell there is that um, the, the stakes are being raised but it's not just at the CISO level it's at the supporting levels underneath is that we need to know that we've got specialist people that can help deliver quality service so this is all very different from me when I started off in 1993 
working out which products we should put on standalone PCs because we have boot sector viruses that I never in a million years thought it would go down uh, routes like this. Um, so that just gives you a, a sort of flavour of some of the things that are out there. We're seeing that organisations are having trouble recruiting for security people as well. Um, this is some data that's come from eSkills. The previous slides, I can't claim to have put um, all of those together. They were put together by Alistair McWilson, who's our chairman. And he used to be the global technology officer for Accenture. So what he's been seeing on a global um, stage is, is extraordinary. And he's tried to encapsulate some of those things for me in those slides. eSkills have done quite a lot of work in terms of looking at um, building capability uh, for employers in the future uh, in the technical spheres. And they did a, uh, a survey and it came back with the fact that they were seeing 85% of business, businesses were struggling to get the right security people um, to, in their organisations. And that's a sort of breakdown and I'm sure Steve will make these slides available afterwards. But um, if you look at, um, now, where's the clicky thingy? Is it that one? Oh, yeah. Um, if you look at the, the ones at the top, um, Security architect, you might expect to see there, uh, but intelligence and threat analysis, I mean, that's a sort of relatively new area for uh, information security. Um, but we're seeing a lot more of that sort of uh, thing, well, re requirement for those sort of skills. And they're people that we're probably taking from outside of the security, the natural security environment that we might be looking to the intelligence services or we might be looking to, to, to the business, to look at business intelligence, especially for things like the social media um, sites and, and how you protect your organization um, using social media or, or, or stop it causing you problems. Um, and then, you know, it's, you can see sort of things that SCADA is now becoming on the map. Um, you wouldn't have had a dot hardly for that maybe four years ago, three, four years ago. So those are the sort of things that people are looking for. Um, and they also looked at where the people in the industry were actually coming from. And again, if you, if you look at the, the large majority of people that are working in information or IT security, they don't have a formal education background. But we're seeing that changing as well, because we need to develop people that have been through a more formal education to be able to deliver the services that will take us tomorrow and to be able to meet the skills shortage. All right. And there's not many of us girls around. So, you know, we need to get more women into the, into the industry is that it's predominantly a male dominated industry. And it's a shame because that's 50% of the workforce that are not looking to take careers within information security. I think a lot of that is to do with the name, information security. I mean, it doesn't sound, it do, does, it do a few, does it do a few ladies? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, if we called it something more sexy, I'm sure that we could um, make people um, be more keen to get involved. But actually, I fell into security because um, I wasn't doing anything at the time, particularly in Marks and Spencer, and I was looking for a job change. And um, they said, oh, Manda, or Mandy, as I was called in those days, um, Steve's setting up this thing called computer security. We have no idea what we're supposed to do with this. But would you give him a hand? You're normally pretty good with things that are new. And I thought, OK, that will be something to do for six months. And then 20 odd years later, you're still doing it. But it's changed every time. So we need to sell our industry outside of the community or already or because we're keeping it as very much of a, a secret and the other thing is that it's an aging community as well you know that we need to get more more young people into it so there's a lot of challenges an absolute lot of challenges there and a couple more things about scene setting is um, the way people are working is changing and this is from some work that BP did and so if you look again, you know, sort of some of these things that the, you know, the demog dem demography is changing, you know, this whole thing about low carbon, people working from home, um, globalization. There's so many changes in the way that we're actually working and how we interact 
as well. And people want a work-life balance, and I think we're going to see that more and more. And so I think we're going to see people wanting to do part-time working, wanting to work from home, caring responsibilities, not just for children, but for, for, for older people. Um, so the, we see the rise of the part-time security professional um, coming, basically, as well. So um, this is some feedback from a couple of our cor corporate members, is that, again, it's echoing. This is not just us talking about it. It's echoing um, some of the challenges that we've got, you know, that we need to get more people in. We need to get people that are, are, are very gifted to take us por forward and that we need to be really suppliers of choice. So the employers out here, if you want to get good security people, you need to make sure that you're making your offer attractive to them. And that's not necessarily just money. I mean, the consultancy houses, you know, the big four, they've all got vacancies, huge, you know, vacancy pools, and they, they, they pay mega bucks, but they expect <coughs> people to work very, very, very hard and very long hours and sometimes put their, their, their personal lives on um, hold. So there are other ways of sort of skinning this basically is that you can become a supplier or a, sorry an employer that makes it a great place to work that can offer flexibility so you need to put those sort of things in your compendium when you're looking at employing people um, which is what we've just said there okay so where does the IISP come into this well we're sort of trying to be all pervasive and sort of everywhere I suppose and we're probably trying to do too much in many ways but what we're trying to do is that we're trying to help individuals with their development so we can do that with a number of things really um, that we can provide um, networks uh, we've got the regional branches that um, in fact Steve heads the the Plymouth branch so you you do um, events in line with the BCS on a quarterly basis and getting people together, great speakers, um, opportunities to network. Um, we have a website um, and we've got a congress coming up in, um, in March. And so we're trying to provide things that can help people, but I'll come back to that. We're also trying to help organizations develop capability as well. So we have a corporate membership and that's for organizations of all size to be able to get together with other organizations that are keen about developing um, talent within their organization and um, that uh, we provide things like an associate development program which is to take new people that are new to the industry uh, and we provide them with tools so that they can benchmark their staff and they can look at um, skills gaps and um, various other things from there. We're working quite a lot with government as well. Um, government are taking security seriously. There was a, um, um, uh, an initiative back in 2011, um, which was um, uh, headed up by Francis Maud, and that was very much looking at how do we make um, PLC UK the best place to do security, the best place for people to do business because it's secure. And there were four streams in that, and one was about developing capability and talent in people uh, within the UK. And um, they, CESG have put a lot of time into that and they've developed a CESG certified professional scheme which looks at what you need to be to work in a government area or related area. Um, so if I say CPNI, does that mean anything to, to a lot of people? CPNI is the, the, the um, national critical infrastructure so it's all of the things that make PLC UK runs, so it's everything from the oil companies to um, even supermarkets because you've got to have food on the table, um, power in, in the house and all of that sort of thing. So people working in the CPNI, what they need to have in order to be able to work on government contracts. And they've taken our skills framework, which I'll come back to in a second. We're working with academia because it's very important that we bring on new talent into the industry. And Steve and Plymouth are, are an academic partner, and we've got 10 of those, and uh, we're working closely with them to, to try and encourage new people in. We do um, membership for student members, which is very, very reduced, which allows them to have all of the membership benefits that a, another member would have, an ordinary member would have, so that it can help them to get into the community and, and develop their career. And we're also having loads of partnerships with different people as well. 
So um, we work closely with CESG. We work closely with eSkills, um, who are a sort of quango. I don't know if that's a dirty word, quango. But um, they're, they're not a government organization, but they're funded by government and that they're trying to um, raise standards in technology in schools and develop career paths and learning paths for, for, for people. And they've been awarded um, a, a contract to be looking at information security and how we develop learning pathways and um, the, the competences for that. And they've the, and the, 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 we obviously work closely with them because they've taken our, our skills framework to do that. And other areas like the cyber security challenge. So we try and make sure that we're sort of joining up with all of the different organizations um, that are out there looking at security. And all of the stuff that we're doing is really aimed at developing security professionals that are already in the industry and to bring new ones in and help them on their way as well. So I keep banging on about the skills framework. The skills framework is something that we put together about five years, probably maybe even longer now, five years ago. And it looks at all of the elements that you need to be to be a security professional. And it may be quite difficult to see that from here, but um, if I get my little clicky thing up, um, it runs over all of the areas that you could possibly be specializing in to be a security professional. So you've got the compliance and the uh, management side at the top, risk, um, which is obviously inherent with everything we do, secure development um, methodologies, then the secure operations, things when it goes wrong, um, business continuity, um, forensics, and all of that sort of side of things, an audit. But we, th we believe that a security profession is not just about knowledge. It's very much about, you do need to know stuff, which is saying up there, but it's also proving that you can do it as well, is that it's one thing going on um, a, a course and becoming a CISP, but it's another thing actually being at the coalface, having to sort out a major um, incident within an organization, you know, all the textbooks in the world aren't going to help you. You know, you need the theory, but you've got to have the practice to do that. And where we see ourselves very different from um, other organizations, and that's why we feel that we, we are the authoritative body um, for the um, industry, is that we do everything through peer and, and, re and peer review, is that um, if somebody goes for accreditation with the IISP. Um, it's not just a question of ticking boxes. You've got to demonstrate how you've used that skill within an organization. And your application is reviewed by other security professionals. Now, for the higher levels of full membership, you, you would have to go through an interview. And you would be grilled by two professionals that um, hopefully have similar backgrounds to yourself. I do interviewing, and I love it because you usually end up meeting somebody that's done something that's very interesting, and you end up having a good natter about it, and um, you can tease out the fact that the person has got that expertise and that they know what they're doing. And we won't give them the, the full membership badge unless they can prove that to us. And we do it on a very simple basis, is that we've got a one to four scoring system. Zero means that you know nothing, and that's quite hard sometimes if you've been hanging around security. You should be able to talk about the principles and things like that. Uh, one means that you have an awareness. Um, two means that it's something that you can do, but it's either a legacy skill or it's, it's um, something that you would contribute to rather than, than lead. Um, three means that you are an experienced practitioner in that area, and four is a guru, so you're actually um, shaping the industry in that area. So when we're looking at people to become security professionals, what we're doing is that we're measuring them over the whole of the, what we call the A, A to J, basically, or A to K, because there's also um, contributions to the community, because we expect people to give back as well. And we wouldn't expect somebody to have fours or even threes across all areas, but we'd expect them to have threes against, uh, an average of three against at least one of those color blocks. So they'd either be a security manager, a security risk, advi you know, risk advisor, a developer, secure operations. That they may, it may be that they've got more than one area of expertise because 
of those of you that are already in the industry, you know that you end up sort of acquiring skills as you go around. You know, you might start off in security ops, but then suddenly you end up becoming the security manager and you're responsible for all the compliance and the, um, uh, the uh, setting the risks, uh, setting the, the uh, policies and so on. And at the end of that, what we do is we award people a certificate. And there are two certificates down there. Uh, one is the full member, which is the IISP accreditation scheme. And we have two levels. One is full member, which is for experienced practitioners that have got between five and, well, at least five, but maybe nearly 10 years of experience. And then the lower level of associate, which is for newer people in the ex industry, which who have probably got three to five years experience. Now, the government have taken our skills framework and um, our scoring mechanism um, for their CCP scheme. So they have, we're, we're very pleased and we're very flattered that they've, they've done that. And so the skills framework is becoming the sort of de facto way of measuring security professionals. It doesn't get rid of things like CISPs and all of those things because you need to have those to demonstrate that you've actually applied um, your, your knowledge and um, that you've gained um, a master's and all of those things because we'd expect those things to be there but we would s expect to see them under the umbrella of the skills framework right that's probably enough on that and so the value of the skills framework and we're getting this coming back from lots of different areas now, is that you can use it to benchmark individuals. So you can do it to benchmark yourself so you can see where your areas of expertise lie and also possibly where your skills gaps are. But as an employer, you can benchmark your teams and you can see where your skills gaps are. Or maybe there are skills, gap, skills areas that you don't want to fill. So an um, example I always use for this is, um, uh, forensics. It may be that you don't need to do forensics very often, so you don't need to build up the forensics expertise within your organisation. What you'd want to do is to have an alliance with um, a forensics organisation that could step in if you needed to do an investigation. On the other hand, you're making a lot of risk judgment, so you'd want to have a depth of people that have got um, expertise against the, the risk management areas, which are the B, Bs. Um, we're also using it to benchmark training courses as well. So um, we have training organisations come to us and they say we've got a training course on risk management, business continuity, security development, whatever it is. And um, we look at the, um, uh, the course that they're submitting and um, we benchmark it against the skills framework. So it's either an introductory course or it's a practitioner's course uh, or it's what we call a plus course, which is uh, for an experienced practitioner. And again, these courses are reviewed by experienced uh, security um, people and they're subject matter experts within the area that the course is actually claiming to have um, uh, a knowledge, uh, knowledge transfer. Um, and we're also seeing it used in education as well, so um, that we're also beginning to see master's courses um, uh, being um, uh, accredited or being looked to accredited. And um, there's uh, some work that Steve's actually involved with, um, with CESG, which is looking at accrediting master's um, courses and watch more for this in about next year. Yeah, next year. So it's becoming the sort of benchmarking thing for looking at uh, that. So eSkills have taken it. They're building a national occupational standard with the skills framework over that. They've got learning path, path pathways. That's taking where people should be with information security knowledge from sort of secondary school education through their careers and learning pathways. And there's some work coming out on that after Christmas. Um, the CESG Certified Professional Scheme is already there. We are one of the certifying bodies for that. We've got 75% of the people have come through us as opposed to the other bodies. And we've had about 800 certificates issued um, and the scheme's only been live or well, barely a year now. Um, so that's the skills framework and that's where we feel that we're actually doing something for the industry in terms of providing a, 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 a benchmarking um, tool.
Um, we've talked already a little bit about the uh, accreditation schemes um, and really how, we're, how organisations can use that to develop capability. But it's also about information security professionals being able to say, I've actually been awarded this, therefore my industry thinks I'm good you know, and I'm competent. And um, what we're hoping is for this to be the sort of badge of honour so that people, um, when they're recruiting, they will be looking for people to be members of, of the Information Security Institute, IISP. Um, with the CESG scheme, they have gone down a more specific route. Um, if you're working in government, you have to have that now. So they've gone for six roles and three levels, and they're looking at things at practitioner, um, senior practitioner and lead. We're um, looking at associate and full. Our, um, our marking scale aligns to theirs. Um, we award um, practitioners associate. We award senior practitioners either a, um, associate or full member, depending on the breadth of their, their knowledge. And the full um, uh, membership goes to the lead practitioners. So the two schemes sort of align and um, uh, complement each other. Um, We've also seen some organisations um, that are in our corporate membership using the IISP as a passport to work. So they're expecting people, um, if they join the organisation, to become a member of the Institute and to gain um, a level of um, accreditation within two years as a passport to work. If they don't do that, then they presumably lose their jobs. But I would imagine that's a fairly good way of um, sort of honing the mind to do something. <laughs> so um, I think we're going to see more of that sort of thing happening. Um, as I said, we're going to be going for, yep, that's great. Um, we're going to be going for chartered status um, in the next year or so, and we'll be bringing in fellowship levels. So it's really giving the badges of honor back to people. Um, the way that we help people is providing a support network. We've already talked about the branches. We've got a Congress coming up. We provide information, we can do mentoring for people. We provide opportunities for people to contribute, um, that we have um, a quarterly magazine. And um, I think there's somebody from here in there, isn't there? Yes, I recognize that face. <laughs> so um, there's opportunities to, to be recognized by your peers and to speak at events and to share knowledge and all of those things. And we try and develop new people. We've got an associate development program as well. So, um, and we're increasingly being seen as an industry voice. And we're always looking for people that want to be um, vocal within the, the community. And we're looking for sort of subject matter experts that can represent the institute and obviously raise their own profile as well in doing that. Um, Really, to finish up, we're very, very much about developing professionals of the, the future. We have a thriving academic partner program. We've got about 10 universities. Again, Plymouth is um, uh, one of our, our universities. We're trying to create what we call golden triangles, which is putting uh, universities in touch with um, employers within the area and the branches. So it's creating communities, basically, um, all around the UK and beyond. Um, but uh, with the government initiatives, you know, we're, we're again working there, that the government are looking at um, creating centres of excellence and the MSc accreditation, which Steve is involved in, um, and individual accreditation. So we're again looking at bringing people on from there. E-skills we've already talked about, and the cyber security challenge, which is sort of playing games for people to see whether they've got the aptitude for um, information security. And on the right hand side, um, one of the things I think is quite exciting is De Montford have um, worked with um, Deloitte to develop an MSc. And the more we can see of that, of, the, of industry and academia working together, um, the better as far as we're concerned. Right. I think that's me. I've left a couple of minutes for questions. <laughs>